A cycloidal gearbox is a special type of gearbox that is primarily used for the precise control of moving parts, such as the control of arm movements in robotics. In the following, the structure and operating principle of such a cycloidal gearbox will be explained in more detail. At the heart of this type of transmission is what is known as a cycloidal disc. It resembles a toothed wheel in the broadest sense, but its teeth have a pronounced curved shape. The basic shape of the teeth is that of a cycloid. This is why it is called a cycloidal gear. We will look at the design of a cycloid in more detail later. For now, let's take a closer look at how a cycloidal gear works. In this type of transmission, the cycloidal disc is driven by an eccentric shaft. As the name suggests, this shaft has a shoulder which is not symmetrical to the axis of rotation of the shaft, but is offset. The cycloidal disc is mounted on this shoulder. Fixed rollers are arranged in a circle around the eccentric shaft into which the cycloidal disc engages. As the eccentric shaft rotates, the cycloidal disc is rotated around these rollers by the eccentric motion. The cycloidal disc itself rotates around its axis of symmetry, but in the opposite direction to that of the drive shaft and at a much slower speed. There are holes in the cycloidal disc into which the pins of a so-called load plate behind it engage. In this way, the cycloidal disc drives the load plate. The output shaft is attached to the load plate coaxially with the drive shaft. Comparing the rotational speed of the input shaft with the rotational speed of the output shaft, it is clear that in addition to the reversal of the direction of rotation, there is also a reduction in speed. In this case, the input shaft must rotate 19 times for the output shaft to rotate once around itself. The gear ratio of the cycloidal drive is therefore 19. The gear ratio is therefore very high, even though the gearbox is relatively small compared to conventional gearboxes. The compact and robust design combined with high precision is a major advantage of cycloidal gears. At first glance, the motion of a cycloidal gear appears very complex. However, the idea behind this kinematics is quite simple. Let us first consider a flat plane on which we roll a small disc. For simplicity, the plane is three times as long as the circumference of the disc. If we roll the disc on the plane, it will obviously rotate three times. Now we turn the flat plane into a circle. The diameter of this circular path is now three times the diameter of the rolling disc. If we now roll the disc along the circular path, the disc will additionally rotate once around itself as it revolves around the circle. In total, the rolling disc now rotates four times around its axis of rotation. This seemingly paradoxical behavior is also known as the coin rotation paradox. To prove this, we simply count the revolutions of the rolling disc each time the drawn arrow points downwards and the disc has thus made one complete revolution around its axis of rotation. We can then see that the disc actually rotates a total of four times around the circle three times its size, and therefore always once more than the ratio of the circumferences or diameters of the two circles. As already mentioned, this is due to the fact that the path on which the disc rolls forms a circle itself. However, the fact that the diameter ratio must be increased by one for the number of revolutions of the rolling disc only applies as long as the disc is rolling on the outside of the circular path. In this case, the movement of the center of mass of the disc is in the same direction as the rotation of the disc around its center of mass. In this case, both movements are clockwise. However, if the disc no longer rolls on the outside but on the inside, then the direction of rotation of the disc around its center of mass is opposite to the direction of movement of the center of mass. In this case, the disc will rotate against itself once as it rotates around the circular path. In this case, the diameter ratio must be reduced by 1 to obtain the number of revolutions of the rolling disc. Let's count the number of revolutions whenever the arrow points upwards again. As you can see, the disc rotates twice around itself for every revolution around the circular path. In principle, the kinematics of the cycloidal drive is based on exactly this motion. Let's imagine the rolling disc as a gear and the circular path as a gear with internal toothing. Now we make the rolling gear bigger and bigger in our minds. In this way, we continue to drive the gear wheel around the inside of the ring gear, with the gear wheel rotating clearly in the opposite direction as the speed decreases. This eccentric rotation is then transmitted through holes in the gear to a load plate behind it. It is still true that the number of revolutions of the gear as it rotates around the ring gear is the ratio of the diameters reduced by 1. As the diameters are directly proportional to the number of teeth, the ratio of the number of teeth can be used instead of the diameter ratio. 
The number of revolutions of the rotating gear can therefore generally be determined using the formula shown. The reciprocal of this number is the number of revolutions that the axis of rotation of the rotating gear will must make around the center of the ring gear in order to complete a full revolution around its axis of rotation. This in turn corresponds to the definition of the transmission ratio, so that the transmission ratio of the shown gearbox can be determined using the given formula. We can also write this formula a little more simply, as shown. The closer the number of teeth of the two gears are to each other, the higher the transmission ratio. At the same time, however, the transmission ratio is severely limited as the diameters are so close together at some point that the teeth would interfere with each other. However, this problem can be avoided by using a different tooth profile. This is where the cycloid comes in. Instead of using a gear that rotates around a fixed ring gear, a cycloidal disc is used that rotates around fixed pins. This is how we get the cycloidal gear. The number of teeth on the gear now corresponds to the number of fixed rollers and the number of teeth on the ring gear corresponds to the number of lobes on the cycloidal disc. In this case, the number of pins is 20 and the number of lobes on the cycloidal disc is 19, resulting in a transmission ratio of 19. Let's take a closer look at the construction of the cycloidal disc. As mentioned earlier, the curved shape of the disc is based on a cycloid. A cycloid is obtained by rolling a so-called rolling circle on a base circle. A point on the circumference of the rolling circle then describes the cycloid as a trajectory curve. The curve obtained in this way forms the so-called reference profile of the cycloidal disc. Note, however, that the cycloid disc must later roll around the fixed rollers. Therefore, when constructing the cycloid, the drawing point, in our case the tip of the pencil used to draw the cycloid, must be extended to form a circle. The diameter of this circle corresponds to the diameter of the fixed rollers around which the cycloid disc will later roll. The enveloping contour that is created when the rolling circle is rolled is the actual profile of the cycloid disc. Such a disc profile can also be constructed as follows. First, the reference profile is created as usual with our pencil. Then the center point of a milling cutter, with a diameter equal to the pin diameter, is placed on the reference profile and milled along the cycloid. In this way, the actual equidistant disc profile is also obtained from the reference profile. A disadvantage of a cycloidal disc designed in this way is the relatively large eccentricity, since the curved shape of the cycloidal disc is very pronounced. At high speeds, this leads to enormous unbalance forces. For these reasons, the cycloid disc is often constructed with a so-called contracted cycloid. In such a case, the drawing point is no longer on the circumference of the rolling circle, but inside the rolling circle. Since the drawing point is no longer so far away from the center of rotation of the rolling circle, it will not oscillate as much when the rolling circle is rolled, resulting in a softer outline. The distance of the drawing point from the center of the rolling circle corresponds directly to the eccentricity of the cycloidal disc, which becomes much smaller. Again, the drawing point is extended to a circle with the diameter of the rollers. The enveloping contour now corresponds to the outer shape of the cycloidal disc. The animation shows the comparison of cycloidal discs with ordinary and contracted cycloids. Note the lower eccentricity of the disc designed with a contracted cycloid. In addition, the holes for the load pins behind it are smaller. The specific formulas for determining the geometry of the cycloidal disc are described in the following. First, the desired transmission ratio is specified, which can be determined using the formula already derived. The capital letter N represents the number of fixed roller pins around which the cycloidal disc will later rotate. The lowercase letter N represents the number of lobes on the cycloidal disc. In practice, the number of pins is usually chosen to be greater by one than the number of lobes. This ensures that the contact area between the disc and the rollers is maximized. Furthermore, the diameter dr of the fixed rollers is defined, as well as the pitch diameter d on which they are to be arranged. In addition, the diameter dl of the load pins on the load plate is specified, as well as the corresponding pitch circle diameter on which they are to be arranged. The eccentricity of the cycloidal disc is also specified in advance which is the distance between the center of the cycloidal disc and the center of the circle on which the fixed pins are located. All the variables mentioned so far can be chosen arbitrarily in advance within certain limits.
This now raises the question of what diameter of the rolling circle and what diameter of the base circle are required for the design of the cycloidal disc. The rolling circle must be chosen so that its circumference U corresponds to the distance S between two adjacent rollers. This is the only way to ensure that the distances between the lobes of the cycloidal disc correspond to the distances between the rollers and that meshing is possible. The circumference of the rolling circle is the product of the diameter and the number pi. The distance between two rollers is obtained by dividing the circumference of the pitch circle, resulting from the product of the pitch circle diameter and the number pi, by the number of rollers. We can now cancel the number pi in this equation and obtain the formula for determining the diameter of the rolling circle. The diameter of the rolling circle is therefore equal to the pitch diameter of the circle on which the rollers are located. To construct the cycloidal disc, we still need the base circle diameter. When designing the cycloidal disc, it is important to ensure that the diameter of the rolling circle is a certain integer multiple of the diameter of the base circle so that the outline at the end of the rolling motion transitions smoothly into the outline at the beginning. The diameter ratio is exactly the same as the transmission ratio. This is because, from the point of view of the cycloidal disc, the rollers roll on the cycloidal disc during operation. It is precisely this rolling motion that is used to design the cycloidal disc when the rolling circle rolls on the base circle. The base circle diameter therefore corresponds to the previously determined rolling circle diameter multiplied by the transmission ratio. With the diameter of the rolling circle and the diameter of the base circle, the shape of the cycloidal disc is now clearly defined. However, care must be taken to ensure that the chosen eccentricity of the cycloidal disc is less than the radius of the rolling circle, as only then will you obtain a contracted cycloid. In all other cases an extended cycloid would be obtained but this would not allow the cycloidal disc to mesh with the rollers. The condition given therefore applies to the eccentricity. As already mentioned, the eccentricity also influences the whole diameter dh of the cycloidal disc. On the one hand, the load pins with their diameter dl must fit through the holes, and on the other hand, the holes must take into account the oscillation of the cycloidal disc, which moves up and down by the amount of the eccentricity during one revolution. Therefore, the whole diameter dh must be larger than the load pin by twice the amount of eccentricity. The pitch circle diameter on which the holes of the cycloidal disc are arranged corresponds exactly to the pitch circle diameter of the load pins. In this way, the geometry of the cycloidal gear is now completely determined. The reference profile of a contracted cycloidal disc can be designed with the given parametric equations. It should be noted, however, that this only describes the reference profile. A milling cutter with a diameter dr of the rollers must mill along this profile to obtain the actual contour of the cycloidal disc. Although the rolling of a circle around a base circle is a very clear way to illustrate the shape of the disc, it is not very helpful in modern CAT software for designing the cycloidal disc. A more complex analysis can also be used to derive the parameter equation of the actual shape of the cycloidal disc. Due to its complexity, we will not go into the derivation in detail here, but will simply present the result. With the given equations, the geometry of the cycloidal disc can be determined directly from the roller diameter dr, the corresponding pitch circle diameter d, the number of rollers n, and the eccentricity e. The cycloidal disc obtained with these parameter equations has one lobe less than rollers. In practice, cycloidal gears are usually not operated with a single cycloidal disc, as this can lead to enormous imbalance forces at high speeds. For this reason, a second identical cycloidal disc is usually mounted with a 180 degrees offset. This compensates for the unbalance. When it comes to high transmission ratios combined with a compact design, two types of gearbox are particularly suitable. The cycloidal drive just described and the planetary gearbox. The similarity between the two types of gearbox becomes particularly clear when the ring gear of the planetary gearbox is fixed and the input is provided by the sun gear and the output by the carrier. In planetary gearboxes, the rotating axes are the axes of the planet gears. In cycloidal gearboxes, the rotating axes are the axes of the cycloidal disks. While the planet gears are driven by a sun gear, an eccentric shaft moves the cycloidal disks. The planet gears rotate around the inside of a ring gear, and the cycloidal disks rotate around a ring of rollers. The planet gears drive the carrier and transmit power to the output shaft. Similarly, the cycloidal disks drive a load plate to transmit power to the output shaft. Compared to planetary gears, cycloidal gears are very robust against shock loads, as the cycloidal disk is in almost complete contact with the rollers. In addition, 
Cycloidal gears achieve a significantly higher positioning accuracy due to their very low backlash and high torsional rigidity. Cycloidal gears are therefore ideal for all types of drive technology, especially where high loads and high accuracies are required. Cycloidal gears tend to be lighter and more compact than planetary gears and have a longer service life, especially at high gear ratios. However, for relatively small transmission ratios below 20, planetary gearboxes are generally less expensive and more efficient, depending on the application.